a sun most pure and most lucid. Solar blemishes and imputed effects on climate. Scientific solar study begins. Chapter 1. Our sun, Solus, shines upon us from roughly 149 million kilometers away. It's the only star like it, known to harbor life on any of its nearby planets. People have used solar cycles for telling time, determining seasons, measuring financial periods since antiquity. The notion of cycles implies circles or repetitive phenomena like you see here at Stonehenge. Circles. This is similar to the rings Leonardo da Vinci examined and thought reflected age and weather conditions over long periods of time. Now, centuries later, scientists would prove this connection to be true. But did da Vinci know about more distant cycles, perhaps solar cycles, either as a means of practical measurement or as an abstraction? Were they used and reflected upon? However, other solar phenomena were also known long ago. So long ago, in fact, that perhaps even prehistoric people were familiar with them which is why we do our petroglyph studies. Now, sunspots were seen and explained in China, even in antiquity. And probably a thousand years before any were referred to in the West, a Chinese oracle bone translation from about 3,200 years ago states, will the sun have marks? It really has marks. Many believe that there were connections between the weather and such marks on the sun. And perhaps Pythagoras saw them earlier in some kind of an astronomical, astronomical context as well. In his intricate notations on weather, Theophrates forecasts rain if there were black spots on the sun or wind if there were red spots. Fair weather will be witnessed if the sun rises brilliant but without scorching heat and without showing any special sign in its orb. Much later, the Chinese astrologer for January 10th, 357 AD stated, within the sun, there was a black spot as large as a hen's egg. The scholarly pursuits of cloistered theologians in medieval Europe perhaps prompt, prompted the observations of their parishioners. Could have included drawings of these marks in diaries and books. We assume from these ancient non-Christian and early Christian European notes that people throughout this part of the world were already associating the sun with having marks or blotches on it that challenge the notion of the sun being perfect. That is, the sun that is pure and perfect should be without any marks or blemishes. We can also see from this that such observed impurities may have been thought to have had effects on Earth's weather. <laughs> Who knew? By 1610, Galileo, an English telescope, telescopist, Thomas Harriot, were studying and recording spots with primitive spyglasses in Europe. Johannes and David Fabricus and the Jesuit scholar Christoph Scheiner did the same in 1611, which led to Johannes Fabricus's June 1611 work on the spots observed in the sun and their apparent rotation with the sun. Can you imagine? 
Though Shiner issued to his correspondent, the science patron Mark Welser, three letters on solar spots written to Mark Welser. Galileo later exchanged letters with Welser as well. Galileos are termed the history and demonstrations concerning sunspots and their phenomena. In these letter exchanges, Welser holds up Galileo's examination, the arguments of one Apelles, Shiner's pseudonym, who argued for the sun's physical perfection, claiming that the spots were the sun's satellites. <laughs> And indeed, they're probably not. When impartial examination of the sun began in the 17th century, it did so in earnest. Contention arose in the West between scholars on this matter due to the paradigm shift away from Aristotelian physics at the time. There is biographical evidence of such, showing that contention arose between Shiner and Galileo concerning who discovered what first. Can you believe it? And they were arguing about who discovered what first about the sun. The who was first contention between Shiner and Galileo, including inventing methods of observing sunspots. The first sunspot observations through a telescope and seeing spots on the sun's surface or not. Additionally, there was a lack of clarity regarding who made the first fossili observation or the first determination of the tilt of the solar rotation axis, among others. Now, Shiner could have used pseudonym in his letter exchanges due to his deference to the wishes of his Je Jesuit superiors, some of whom feared that the society, that is the Society of Jesus, would be embarrassed if the astronomers' theories about immaculate sun later proved false. And because Shiner conceived of this artistic proficiency as the correlate of his observational skills. Whew, that's a lot of verbiage. Now, Shiner's desire for anonymity could have been based more on fear of artistic scientific failure than on defying the vows he took for his order. However, as a Jesuit, Shiner could not engage in damaging controversies. Jesuits such as Shiner were imbued with the military-style regimen all members of the order were expected to go through. Taking vows or making pledges were therefore serious matters. Shiner initially used a pseudonym in these controversies as the Jesuit order's wishes was that its members refrain from open participation in controversies. Well, that's what I call science. What say you? And here we can see the line C A. Yes. Galileo, a member of the order of the Lincei. Lincei? followed a main dictate of the order of the Lincei's constitution. This was a vow to not neglect the ornaments of elegant literature and philology, which, like graceful garments, adorn the whole body of science. And while doing so, however, Galileo may have neglected one of the dictates of the Lincei, one that Shiner, as a Jesuit, did not neglect to pass over in silence all political controversies and every kind of quarrels and worldly disputes, especially gratuitous ones, which give occasion to deceit, unfriendliness, and hatred. Well, that sounds like America and the world today, in my opinion, and science in general. Yet these were the modicums of operation in past times. to pass over in silence all political controversies of every kind, of quarrels, of wordy disputes, especially gratuitous ones, which give occasion to deceit, unfriendliness, and hatred. Wow, what a world 
that would be. In addition to Shiner and Galileo, Johannes Kepler, we all know him, was perhaps the first to comment on all three letters from Wes Welser. Convinced that sunspots were physically on the sun, he used a metaphor to describe sunspots. Stains we observe on red hot iron or like slag or dross on the surface of molten metal. We can assume that the, the debates and the letter exchanges of men like Galileo, Kepler, and Shiner had a lasting impression on all who came in contact with them. For instance, Mark Welser's dissemination of those debate letters helped motivate open inquiry regarding at least the sunspot controversy. What Galileo, for one, saw on the sun was a tendency for it to darken and spot over at times when the standard gospel was that it was perfect and unchanging, or as Galileo quotes others, description of it as most pure and most lucid. <laughs> now, one of Galileo's pupils, Benedetto Castelli, invented an easy way to observe sunspots by pointing a spyglass at the sun and letting the disk's image fall on paper. How simple is that? Oops. This way, the spots could easily be seen rolling across the sun's face while seen on a white painted wall, for instance, or in this case, a piece of paper on the podium. Galileo, either taking a cue from Kepler or of his own accord, likened the sunspots alternatively to clouds or smokes. And he said they were produced and dissolved on the sun's face. He illustrated this by stating, Surely, if anybody wants to imitate them, the spots, by means of earthly materials, no better model could be found than to put some drops of incombustible bitumen or coal on a red-hot iron plate. From the black spot thus impressed on the iron, there will arise a black smoke that will disperse in a strange and changing shape. Now, Galileo challenged the idea that the spots were other planets going by the sun, as Johannes Kepler supposedly first thought in November of 1607, when he confused the sunspot with the transit of Venus. Amateur. Now, Galileo doubted that they were the sun's satellites, as the Jesuit Shiner and Father Jean Tardet originally thought. It was held that sunspots trailed their shadows, or phases, across the sun's disk. Galileo argued against the sunspots being stars, or even the brownish areas where holes through a fiery shell concealing a dark surface that hid the real sun the sun's surface. Former Jesuit colleagues of Galileo and fellow, fellow members of the order of Lince, or the Linuxes, such as the Jesuit John Schreck, who are all these people we're learning about? Such as the Jesuit John Schreck visiting China on an invitation, describes spyglass viewed sunspots in 1628. And you're looking at them here. On the sun, there are spots of various sizes. One, two, three or four, but no more. <laughs> but no more. He was rhyming there. They are found always above the line running east and west across the sun. That's called the equator, John. By the way. They constantly follow the same trajectory. Yes, because the sun is rotating, John. When the first spots are finished, others take their place. The largest spots cause the light of the sun to be dimmed. When the spots were first discovered, they were thought to be Venus, perhaps Mercury. But the trajectories do not agree. Observed recently with the telescope, they have, on the one hand, been seen not to be part of the body of the sun, but on the other hand, not distant from the sun, like red clouds, but to be exactly in front of it. What they are 
is unknown. Now, finally, as we wrap up tonight, chapter one, Rene Descartes, somewhat belated, developed a foam theory about sunspots. What is to be noted in all these matters is the interpretation of what these people observed. True science, in fact. Rather than denying that anything impure could be see upon the sun, which was the rule of the day. Because denial of seeing anything at all on the solar surface is what many churchmen and natural philosophers did at the time on purpose to keep up the narrative. Are you picking it up? From Christianity's beginning through the Middle Ages, changelessness in the sun was tied to the sun's spiritual perfection as it reflected in Christ. And although the Bible states instances when the sun did change, it was a bidden spiritual belief that profundity brought on by, for instance, witnessing that something such as solar change could be beyond common understanding. That is, behind the physical phenomenon of the sun was a deeper spiritual significance. And this spiritual significance was of paramount importance of the time. All else could be easily ignored. Among the learned in the 17th and 18th centuries, the thought that the sun was beyond one's understanding in a physical sense was decidedly on the wane. Additionally, the accepted understanding from medieval times and earlier that the earth was hopelessly corrupted and defiled place was also being rethought. Seen in this way, it is clear that at least a core of people in the Northern Hemisphere understood and took pains to record sunspots moving in groups and disappearing around the sun's edge, only to reappear again. This and other recorded phenomenon like fossilized sightings found its way into written records. And by the 17th century, select people in Europe and Asia knew that sunspots favored certain locations on the sun. And this knowledge was per perhaps spread everywhere. Many among began passing the light in trying to explain the sun's more stubborn secrets, distinguishing between the spiritual understanding of the sun and its purely corporeal substance and behavior. This quest is ongoing, whether the sun is studied by itself or considered in tandem with Earth. Now the problem we have today is that hundreds of years later, this same type of dogma and disbelief exists. I just posted a video on the fact that suns, the sun causes increased cosmic rays at solar minimums, which increases hail size, and many people attack me, even scientists. It takes decades to erase the dogma. And I'm reading you very old information, which is very applicable to today in a quest for you to gain knowledge on what's going on with the sun, with the climate, with the current state of science. Proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Share this with like-minded people and re-watch the video. I will leave you links to the entire PDF as we slowly wade through it chapter by chapter. Thanks for watching. We love each and every one of you. Happybirdseed.com Be safe. That's a poem. Click on one of the other boxes to gain more knowledge.